You know, as I finished the research for volume three of the World War II trilogy and began thinking about next project, the obvious thing would have been to pivot to the Pacific, having done the Mediterranean and the Northwest European campaigns. Uh, and I just decided I didn't want to do that, partly because I would have had to start World War II over again uh, at Pearl Harbor or even earlier. Uh, and partly because it didn't have the same exercise, didn't have the same hold on my imagination that uh, the European theater had. And so I began to think in very fundamental terms about what is it you want to do for the next big block of your life. And um, I thought about Vietnam, I thought about various other topics, uh, and just came back to a subject that has had a hold of my imagination since I was a kid, and that's the revolution. So I began thinking about... Um, how could I do this? What could I add to it? Uh, obviously, there's been a whole lot of great scholarship for 200 years, and I uh, thought I would give it a try because it's the creation myth. It's the, um, it's the origins of the country. It, it speaks to the 21st century as uh, vividly, I think, as it spoke to men and women of the 18th century. Uh, and so that's why I swung that way, going back uh, two centuries, instead of uh, staying with what I knew, I decided I wanted to take a chance on what I didn't know. Well, uh, certainly for many Americans, it's as remote as uh, the Peloponnesian Wars. And um, I think that one of the challenges for any historian, any narrative writer, is to remind people that it is, in fact, uh, current, that the issues and the personalities are um, uh, directly tied to us. And uh, one of the issues about the revolution, I think, that many scholars have wrestled with is uh, my theory, having written about four different wars previously, uh, is that um, every book that I write about war is an anti-war book because the heart of any uh, war is tragedy. It's hard to find tragedy in the revolution frequently. It's hard to find that tragic core of young men dying young, which is the essence of the tragedy of war, I think. Um, and uh, so I think what um, my task is, is trying to bring that back and make the emotional resonance of the revolution, not just in political terms, but in human terms, uh, something that uh, speaks to readers in the 21st century. Well, it's a whole different set of uh, research archives, for one thing, than I'm accustomed to for World War II. The expertise that I had developed uh, in looking at places uh, like the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, or the U.S. Army Military History Institute in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, for the most part are not of use to me in looking at the revolution. Uh, the center of gravity for revolutionary research is places like um, uh, Ann Arbor, uh, where you've got uh, the fabulous uh, Clements Library, and uh, Massachusetts and New York Historical Societies. Um, so uh, having to master the historiography is one thing, having to master the archival troves uh, is another challenge. If you're an archive rat like I am, it's a challenge you enjoy because it's the mystery of the next unopened box. And that's the same whether you're researching World War II or the revolution or anything else. Um, the, the, the scope of material that's available is quite different from World War II. Obviously, there were 16 million Americans in uniform in World War II. Uh, that is far vaster than the number who were involved in the revolution. Uh, they were mostly semi-literate in World War II. That's not necessarily the case with the revolution. They had typewriters in World War II. It's all quill pens and pencils in the 18th century. So there's not nearly as much uh, first-hand account information from ordinary soldiers, particularly. Um, and that's a challenge. On the other hand, the historiography is far deeper than it is for World War II. There have been many, many more good works of scholarship written about events connected to the revolution than for the Second World War. 
And that's uh, got its own challenge. It's uh, the stacks of books that you've got to get through and, and scholarly articles and so on is uh, that, that's it's been quite daunting as well as illuminating. So there are different problems uh, for a historian with each period. Yes, and yet, uh, you know, when you dig a little deeper, you find that they actually have more experience than you might expect. Uh, there are a lot of officers in particular who have experience from the French and Indian War, and most of the leaders have experience, and to some extent, they've got uh, more combat experience than leaders in that World War II Army. Um, you figure the United States Army in World War II grew to 8.3 million, and uh, only a handful of them at the beginning, when we got into it in earnest in 1942, had ever heard a shot fired in anger. Dwight Eisenhower had never heard a shot fired in anger. Omar Bradley. Um, and those who had been involved in World War I, usually it was a fairly, uh, a relatively small uh, period of time where they actually had combat experience. You look at the uh, cohort from the revolution and you find that, uh, okay, well, they were involved in various uh, escapades in uh, fighting on behalf of the British against the French and the Indians. And um, it doesn't give them the ability to uh, maneuver large armies or even battalions for that matter, but they do have the experience of leading men in combat or have, having been in combat. They've been through the, 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 the sometimes terrors of close infantry combat. And um, so, yeah, Washington certainly and his generals have enormous challenges, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I think, a bit surprised in recognizing uh, the fact that these are men who are very comfortable with fire locks, for one thing. Um, they've been carrying muskets for a long time. They've been shooting at things. Um, and they've got a custom by virtue of the fact that they're, uh, uh, in many cases, frontiersmen, even if the frontier is in Massachusetts, to um, living the rugged infantry life. Um, and this is not something you have to teach them as you had to teach inductees in World War II. How to what camp life is like? They know what camp life is like, so um, it's it's rough material he's working with George Washington. But um, you can see that the the clay can grow tall, and he's uh, he's um, he's got some material to work with. Well, I lived with uh, Dwight Eisenhower for 15 years and felt like I got to know him very well. Um, and I do think about the parallels between the two. It's kind of inevitable if you're in my position, and there are parallels. Um, uh, again, Eisenhower has much less combat experience than Washington. Washington has actually been a soldier for five years and has been in very, very intense combat. He's seen his commanding officer essentially die in his arms. Eisenhower had no experience like that. Um, they uh, come into the job because they've been chosen largely as political generals. And they have that very much in common. Franklin Roosevelt chooses Dwight Eisenhower to be the commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force for the final campaign beginning in Normandy because, as Roosevelt says, he's the best politician among the generals. Washington is chosen somewhat for similar reasons. He is a compromise. He's a Virginian in an army that at that point is entirely New Englanders, uh, a different country altogether from his Virginia. And um, he's chosen because there is a, a recognition by John Adams and others that he's got political skills. These are enormously important for any general of a large coalition force, and the colonial army is a large coalition force. And so you see both uh, Washington and Eisenhower bringing this skill set to the job and growing, getting better and better at it, actually. I find that Washington is a better field marshal than Eisenhower. Eisenhower has some real uh, holes in his game as a field commander. He doesn't see the, the, the field uh, spatially and temporally the way a great captain does. Washington, who makes some serious mistakes as a field commander, obviously, nevertheless 
pulls off some things, Tr Trenton being the obvious example, that uh, I don't think Eisenhower uh, had in his playbook. Um, you see their ability to handle subordinates um, with similar deft touches. Um, again, it's imperfect. It's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to master while you're also waging, in each case, ultimately a world war. Uh, but you see that they've got leadership skills that are quite similar. They've got uh, traits that uh, strike me as being uh, very much of a piece. Uh, their ability to pick out subordinates, in Washington's case, the Henry Knoxes, uh, the Greens of the war, who may not be obvious as great military leaders to most people, but somehow Washington sees them. Eisenhower has similar skills. He is able to put a finger on uh, the, the James Gavins of the war, the Matthew Ridgeways of the war, and recognize that these are men born to lead other men in the dark of night. So um, it's fascinating to live with the two of them together. Well, when he arrives in Cambridge in July of uh, 1775, he is famously appalled by what he sees. I mean, no one even knows how many soldiers are there. Uh, he's deluded about how much uh, gunpowder he's got. Uh, the, um, the, the kind of rambunctious nature of the New Englanders uh, offends him. Um, and he recognizes, I think quite legitimately, that he's got to form this into a quasi-professional force, that he's, he, he knows full well how good the British Army is. It's got its problems, too, and particularly in waging expeditionary warfare across 3,000 miles of ocean. But he recognizes that if they're going to be able to uh, fight on anything like even terms, that he's got to uh, professionalize the army. He's got to make the officers appropriately responsible for their men. He's got to impose discipline across the board. He's got to, uh, uh, he's got to delve into every aspect of running an army. He's got to be his own quartermaster. He's got to be his own personnel chief. Um, he's got to be his own strategist. He's got to be his own general staff, basically. Uh, all of this while doing the most fundamental thing that a commanding officer has to do, and that is to shape this army into a, uh, uh, an entity that can fight. Uh, and so, uh, God, what a challenge. I mean, what a, what a task. Uh, fortunately, he's got uh, a bit of breathing space while they're uh, besieging Boston, and he's able to impose uh, some discipline and able to do the kinds of things that he needs to do even as men are coming, men are going, men are deciding whether they want to serve for a month, they want to serve for a year. Uh, it's, it's a nightmare uh, if you're George Washington. And yet he's got a certain, even as he's tearing out his hair, a certain equanimity about it. He's got, I think, a faith in the, in the future is the essence of it. He's got a faith in his countrymen, even as he's denouncing the scoundrels routinely. Um, he's got, I think, a faith in his subordinate commanders, and that probably is the most important thing. He's not in it alone. He's got uh, men who are able to be part of this a task he's got uh, ahead of him, and that uh, must be very reassuring. Well, initially there's a belief that Bunker Hill is a defeat. Uh, now, the British have had tremendous casualties, uh, more than a thousand dead and wounded, and uh, they've really had their butts handed to them. And uh, it doesn't take long, I think, for uh, Americans to recognize that this is not a defeat, that in fact it's pretty significant uh, uh, victory. Uh, even if you've given ground in Charlestown, uh, it's, it's at best a Pyrrhic victory for the British. Um, and it causes them to think, gosh, if we could just do Bunker Hill over and over again, um, this war business wouldn't be that difficult. If we could only get the British to, you know, uh, try uh, ineffectually to outflank us where there are no flanks, uh, or come head on at us when we've got the high ground, um, uh, I think we could probably do all right. Well, the British are too uh, canny to 
repeat uh, the mistakes of Bunker Hill. William Howe, who's been there and had his in, entire immediate professional family shot down around him, is not inclined to fall into that uh, trap. Uh, so I think what you see is a, 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 a devout wish that if you could only set up the circumstances in which Bunker Hill would repeat itself, then the war would swing in favor of the Patriots rather quickly. And of course, uh, history never repeats itself and battles never repeat themselves, uh, particularly when you've got an opponent who has learned from his own mistakes. So Bunker Hill, in, in, in a certain uh, sense, has uh, uh, caused the Americans to have a delusion about what kind of war they're going to be fighting. Well, you know, what is the trait that Napoleon most appreciates in his subordinate generals? Luck. And you have to say that George Washington has more than his share of luck. Now, luck is the residue of preparation, and you make your own luck in war to some extent. This is true. But uh, in New York, he's got some luck. Uh, part of the luck is in the uh, inability of his uh, opponent to... Uh, really press home uh, de a decisive victory in Brooklyn, for example. Howe has good reasons for not wanting to throw uh, his uh, soldiery into the teeth of American defenses at Brooklyn. He recognizes that this big force that's been provided to him, both British and German, um, is, a, is all he's going to get. And if he throws away casualties on the order of those that had been suffered at Bunker Hill, um, it's going to be very difficult if the war goes beyond the summer of 1776. And so he's reluctant to do that. It's not because he's inert. It's not because he's incompetent. It's because, and it's, I think it's not because uh, he's got a soft spot for the Americans. Um, I don't believe that those are the uh, prevailing uh, factors in his thinking about it. So Washington gets a little breathing room and he gets weather conditions that uh, prevent the British from blockading uh, the East River. Uh, he gets a nice fog that comes in and uh, hides uh, the, the evacuation just long enough. That's luck. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think what you see with Washington is uh, a, a, a boldness, but also a, a uh, fortune favors the bold, uh, but sometimes um, good luck favors uh, the fortunate. And uh, uh, I, you see this in Washington's career repeatedly, where conditions are such that had the weather been different, had the weather been different at Princeton, had the weather been different uh, in crossing the Delaware, um, then the, the outcome of the battles might have been different. Uh, and so, you know, you want your generals to be lucky, and George Washington is generally pretty lucky. Well, he, Howe is responsible for um, what happens. Uh, he would be, um, he would receive accolades were he to have exterminated the rebellion in 1776. And the fact that he didn't, uh, I think he is in fact culpable. Now, there are very good reasons for him doing what he does and him not doing what he doesn't do. Um, he's got supply issues of the first order. Um, he is trying to wage an expeditionary warfare of a sort that really has not been waged probably since the Romans. Uh, and he's got to bear in mind that um, the transport of horses across the North Atlantic in stormy weather is impossibly difficult. Uh, the transport of the forage, because he's having trouble getting forage in America for those horses, is very, very difficult. The supply of his soldiers is very much tied to the, the uh, bases he's got on the American littoral, first in Boston, then in New York, 
And the farther he ventures away from those supply dumps and magazines, the more difficult and more exposed he is. So his rather languid progress across New Jersey, I think, is in part explained by his supply concerns. Um, he's also a, a man who constitutionally, I think, um, is extraordinarily methodical to the point of plotting. Um, it's one jump, two jumps, three jumps, uh, sequentially. He's not a great captain either. Uh, and so, you know, you see him allow Washington to get away at Brooklyn, where annihilation was certainly a possibility for the Americans. You see, even though he's whittled down that American force to 3,000 men by the time they reach the Delaware, and yet that's 3,000 men that obviously form the basis for an extraordinary stroke by Washington. And so I think, you know, you have to say, okay, I understand what Howe is doing and why he's doing it. And yet a bolder, more creative, more aggressive uh, general who was intent on exterminating the revolution when he could fails to do it. I think the uh, determination that Washington shows not to be defeated, not to feel defeated, and to transmit to his, uh, his force, including his uh, immediate subordinates, all the way down to the most unlettered uh, private, the notion that we're not beaten and we have an opportunity to do something spectacular here under the most horrific conditions. It reminds me of the Battle of the Bulge. It's cold, it's nasty, the conditions are horrible. Um, and yet, uh, Washington's ability to rally this force to do this extraordinary difficult crossing of a river that's choked with ice and a howling storm and all the rest of it, um, a novelist couldn't make it up. It wouldn't be believable. Uh, you would say this is really uh, something out of a very fertile imagination that couldn't possibly have happened, and yet it obviously d did happen. Um, again, his, uh, he's, he has learned as a consequence of the experiences of the past year and a half um, to take care of details. And so the, the, the detailed battle planning uh, of everything from ensuring that he's got enough boats and that the British don't have any boats uh, to how you get your artillery across. Because he knows, having conferred with Knox, that uh, the weather's nasty, the firelocks are going to have a difficulty, uh, that artillery is probably going to be more effective on a wet, nasty night, uh, and that artillery gives him a, a, a firepower advantage that um, he can exploit. Uh, the, the nuances of the planning involved in the crossing the Delaware are very, very impressive. It's a real professional military man thinking this through down to the last uh, uh, detail. And, uh, and I think that impresses me most about the crossing. It's not the the uh, the final effect where they defeat the garrison completely and rout the Germans, uh, but it is the planning for it uh, and the uh, uh, and the ability to rally the force to uh, embrace this nutty idea with enthusiasm that I think is most impressive. Uh, Frederick the Great, having learned what happened at, at Trenton and Princeton. Uh, is deeply impressed. This is a guy who knows something about battles. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, 240 years later, we can be just as impressed as Frederick was. You know, you would think that uh, Washington, having uh, had the good fortune of success at Trenton, Trenton on Christmas night, um, 1776, would uh, collect his winnings and call it a day. Um, he'd been through a very tough campaign. He'd lost New York. Uh, he'd been uh, chased across New Jersey. And so you would think that a sensible man would uh, know when to uh, 
to uh, take his winnings and go home. He doesn't do that. And uh, again, I think we see here a, 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 a mind, a military mind of a very high order operating. He crosses the Trenton, uh, crosses the Delaware River again. He goes back to Trenton, occupies Trenton again, and basically uh, dares the British to come attack him in Trenton. Again, his thinking of uh, how to prepare for the second crossing, how to deploy his forces um, is pretty impressive. Now, he's being improvisational at that point. He gets back across the Assunpink Creek and um, now what? Um, he's in danger of being trapped. Uh, and yet the boldness continues to be the major key in his personality and his generalship at that time. Uh, and he decides rather than trying to scurry away either into the southern Jerseys or get back across the Delaware, which would have been very difficult at that point, to go the other way and to outflank the British and go to Princeton and to take down the small garrison that's been left there. Again, luck intrudes and the, the weather turns abruptly cold and it's a lot easier to move across these frozen roads than it would have been 12 hours earlier. Uh, it's very, very impressive to me as somebody who studied um, generals all my professional life and spent a lot of time with some very fine generals in the Second World War and other wars. Um, I think when you see Washington doubling down in Second, Prince, in Second Trenton and Princeton, uh, that's when you think, this guy really has, he's a man of parts. Uh, he's a real general. And I think that uh, an Americans thinking about George Washington as our first and greatest general uh, ought to think of Second Trenton and Princeton as uh, proof positive that he is the uh, he's the the man of the hour, and he is uh, he is the general that will lead us to victory. Well, there's a lot, and uh, I write about war, uh, not because I'm particularly interested in battles per se or the hardware involved, but because war is a great revealer of character. The incredible stress of combat uh, reveals the inner metal of the combatants in a way a prism reveals the inner spectrum of light. It flays it open, and you see that in the revolution. So there are... Uh, uh, characters that I just find my head swivel, swiveling toward them uh, inevitably. Benedict Arnold is an obvious and uh, completely mesmerizing figure. Uh, Green and Knox. I'm spending a lot of time looking at the Brits. I, I find the British um, absolutely beguiling. Uh, they remind me a bit of us today in some uh, fundamental ways. And so I'm spending a lot of time, time trying to understand the Howe brothers, uh, uh, try, looking at uh, Graves and Shuldham, uh, the, the British admirals, trying to understand their problems, trying to understand uh, British naval strategy in the context of this rebellion in North America. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time trying to understand Guy Carleton, the British governor and general of Canada. Uh, what is it about Carleton that manages to save Canada? I think uh, the American ambitions to make Canada the 14th uh, colony are thwarted only by Guy Carleton. Um, and he, again, he's imperfect as a general. He lets the Americans get away uh, at, at uh, Champlain and, and earlier in the Canadian battles. And yet uh, he's got a sympathy for Canada as Canada, and not just a, 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 a pawn in the British Empire that's quite impressive. It's, it's uh, ahead of his time in some ways. So in trying to understand who Guy Carleton was and uh, the, 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 um, the belief system that Guy Carleton had. Is, so there's no shortage of uh, fantastically interesting, complex, um, arresting characters that I'm finding.